All right, got an in-depth video for you guys with my revised enduro bike. Last year I made an enduro bike that was kind of pieced together with some downhill parts, chain stays, tubing, head tubes, a lot of the same stuff that we used on our downhill bike to make a first proof of concept of what I thought a nice enduro bike would be. So looking at this bike, what are the changes? We made it a lot lighter. The construction is better suited to an enduro bike. We use thinner wall tubing. It's actually the same tubing we use on our production downhill bike. But at the time we made this last year, we were running thicker tubing. So this uses a two inch by 065 down tube and a one and three quarter inch by 065 top tube. And as I said, that's the same stuff we're running on our downhill race bikes. So it's proven, it's bulletproof, but it is lighter than what we used last year on an enduro bike. We were using OED3 tubing last year. We use a similar lug head tube design to what Faction designed on our bonded frame. There was so much welding going on around the top tube with side plate gussets, fingernail gussets on the top and bottom, that there was some distortion around the head tubes of our DH bikes. And going to this design, we can make the head tube, the whole joint, a little bit lighter. And it also takes away the heat affected zone from the actual headset cup which is a really important tolerance to get right on the bike for longevity. You need those things to be tight and concentric and perfectly round. And with a lot of welding, sometimes that can be difficult. We also tried to copy their BB piece, which is a similar concept to ours that we used on our last bike and on our downhill bike, but just a little bit lighter way to do it. It has some ports for the CNC machine to reach in and get more material out of the inside of it. So it's a little bit lighter. And then similar to what we did on the head tube, we just plug it with a, right now, a 3D printed piece that covers that hole that the CNC machine created. The big thing for this bike that we needed to do differently was make a new chainstay mold. This chainstay is actually really nice. It's not just different to fit on this bike. It has a lot of improvements that I learned along the way. Looking back, I could have done better. It puts the bearings in the chainstay instead of in the mainframe, which does two things. It puts them at a wider position, which is a stronger place on the bike. It also puts the quality control into the carbon manufacturer's hands. So they QC check it. The tolerance of that bearing is perfect. It's in carbon. It's not in heat treated aluminum that we make ourselves handmade. So that's a much tighter tolerance that makes our frames more accurate, more precise that I think is a big improvement going forward. The main pivot axle we use is pretty cool. It's keyed on one side, so it pushes all the way through. It has a keyed interface to the mainframe, so you just tighten it from one side. You don't need tooled access behind your chain ring, which is sometimes hard to get to. It's kind of well thought out, pretty happy with it, pretty proud of it. We also have internal cable routing for your shifter cable through the chainstay only. And I've been pretty open about external cable routing being something that I've been really happy with with my bikes. I would never put a brake cable inside the frame, especially when you're racing. I think it's ridiculous to have to take a good brake off and re-bleed it whenever you need to swap from bike to bike or if you have a issue at a race. But a gear cable, I feel like if you're gonna change it, you're gonna change it. And it's not really something that you get a, it's like a brake you get a bleed on. Pushing it through the chainstay allows us to run a cleaner routing on the non-drive side of the bike. It enters the frame in the chainstay bridge on the non-drive side, goes across and out the top of the chainstay, which I think will be really nice. Currently, I have an access drivetrain, so you can't really see that. It's what I had to use, but we put a cable through to check and it, it, it's really smooth. It has internal guides, so push it in one side and out the other. I think that'll be a nice thing going forward. If we use this chainstay on our downhill bike, we're using mechanical drivetrain, or if we're using Shimano in the future, um, we get good cable routing on there. I'll just touch on all the geo numbers. They're pretty similar to my last bike. Kind of a step down a little bit from my downhill bike, but I think appropriate for enduro. The bike has 170 mil travel front and rear, it runs a 170 38 and a 230 by 65 standard mount shock. The reach on this bike is 480 with a 663 stack. The chainstay length is 455. Head tube angle is 63.75. BB height is 340. 
C2 bangle is 79.5. Those are all our main numbers. Um, C post insertion is 320 millimeters. I'm currently running a 240 mil dropper post. I'm six feet tall and fits in there nicely for me. Uh, I think for another rider that's a little shorter, they could get away with a 200 on this bike. I think that's something really nice. Whenever I ride enduro bikes, it's kind of one of my pet peeves is how much seat post insertion they have coming from a DH side of things. I always like the seat to be low and out of the way. And some of the bikes that I've ridden in the past, I can't really get the seat post in as far as I want to, to run a long dropper post. The bike as it sits weighed in at 37.5 pounds or 17 kilograms. Pretty much aside from a 38 and a 230 by 65 shock, a dropper post and 12 speed drivetrain, it has all the same parts as my downhill bike. Downhill tires, downhill wheels, same bars, brakes, cranks, pedals, everything that I use on my downhill bike. So it's by no means a light build. I think that attributes to the way it rides too. I really like the feel of that coming from the downhill side of things. But I think we could pretty easily build it a little bit lighter and kind of be around that 36 pound mark. Um, I watched one of the bike checks from the enduro races recently and I think 37 and a half was the average weight. So for this bike's intended use, I think it's in a pretty good spot weight wise actually being an aluminum frame with some carbon parts and a pretty burly build on it. Ride wise, I'm super happy with it. I feel like we retained everything that the last bike did well. We brought the C2 bangle back a little bit. It was kind of crazy on the last one, but I kind of knew that going in. Reduced the weight. The BB is quite a bit lower. I think it's 10 mil lower than what we were running on the last bike with the 170 fork. When we put that 170 fork on, it raised it a lot. So the bike actually feels bigger than it is. I think it's a, the reach is a little bigger as well with this stack, but your hands and feet being further apart with a lower BB make the bike feel a little bit bigger and I don't know, more like a DH bike. It feels pretty aggressive to ride. This one's honestly geometry wise and kinematics. It's one of the closest to a downhill bike feeling enduro or trail bikes that I've ever ridden. It's not big and sluggish, it's efficient and it goes fast, it's precise, it goes where you want it to. But my whole idea with it was stability through geometry and predictability through kinematics. And then with an enduro bike, it needs to do a lot of things. It needs to go uphill and downhill. And I think this one <laughs> struck the balance really well. It's still a bike with two wheels and you have to ride it. It's not a magic carpet, but I'm really happy with it. The shock tune right now, we just put the same valve code as we had in our downhill bike on the production shocks we sold into this shock. I had to do a team order form from Fox and I just copied that valve code and put it into a 65 stroke. And it's pretty good. I think with a test session with Fox, I can get the shock to feel a little better. Probably get one that's matched to these kinematics even better. But as a starting point, this bike's pretty darn good. I'm really happy with it. Obviously it was my idea. It's my theory of how an enduro bike should ride, but super stoked. We're planning to offer these things for sale later this year. It's been a big work in progress, but our plan is to do four sizes. We'll do a small, medium, large, and extra large in reach increments of 20 mil. So we were thinking 440, 460, 480, 500 with chain stay lengths specific to each size. So the bike's proportionally kept intact through each size. Hopefully we'll be able to offer some more information soon and open up our pre-sales later this summer with delivery still this year. We're still starting out, we're super small. Logan and I do everything ourselves, and we have no outside investment. So we're trying to be smart with our process to sell these, um, try to be smart with the development as well. Not having a lot of money to burn, we gotta really scrutinize every detail before ordering the samples. And took a little bit longer than I had hoped for riding the, the bike last summer. I wish I had this thing right away, but super stoked with the way this bike turned out. Beat the shit out of it a little bit more this summer and get another sample in each one of the sizes to make sure they work well. We're gonna send a few to Faction that they can put through their bench test and break in the lab. But otherwise, bike's really good. Thanks very much for watching our video. Just wanted to share this with you. Super excited to 
be able to finally show it off and uh, have more info to come soon. And just want to say thanks to Worldwide Cyclery, one of our biggest sponsors. They have a landing page on their website where I wrote some information about each component that we use. Um, if you're watching this, you probably ride your bike a lot and you might need new bike parts. When you do, if you can get them through Worldwide, that helps us out. They help fund our program and keep us going through the season. So anyway, support the people who support us. Thanks very much for watching. See you in the next one.